Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Shlomi Ashkenazi. Shlomi is the CEO of Green Q. Green Q attaches sensors to garbage trucks and builds an internet of garbage. Uh, Shlomi, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Hey, Hi, good everybody. to have you. <laughs> thank so, you, thank you. I guess first, before we go any further, uh, what is an internet of garbage? Like, what, what's the point of that? <laughs> Why would you do such a thing? Like, you know, there are a lot of companies that are doing IoT things, and uh, <laughs> we are very focused about garbage, so <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but, taking all the, the information to the cloud. Cool. So is that like where a piece of trash came from, what its volume is, maybe its mass, uh, what color is it, what's it made out of, like what kind of information, I guess, like who are your clients, what do they want to know about the garbage, wow. why is this service valuable to them? I'm just, <laughs> I, I like to ask a lot just of kind one, of one questions. Just small, one small question. <laughs> yeah, my bad, Doug. <laughs> Let's begin with something. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so basically uh, what we do is uh, we assist the uh, waste collection managers to have a better uh, view about what is happening on the streets. Cool. Uh, and you asked about uh, the basic data brick actually, what, what is the um, basic information that we take from the truck to the cloud and then uh, build all the value out of it. So the basic will be what have we collected, where from, uh, to compare it to the canister that it belongs to, because it's always interesting to understand how full is the bin. Cool. Um, and uh, from there on, we have a data point that describes exactly what was happening on the street. So now we can go further and build alerts, all kinds of insights, uh, and better planning for the, for the next route, next week, next season, next contract, and so and so. Nice. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so in my mind, uh, you would alert on something or optimize based on something, and I'm probably going to get this wrong. So I, I would think if maybe a trash can is only getting filled half full all the time, maybe you could deprioritize that on a garbage truck's route and come to that area less often to save uh, labor, basically. And, uh, or maybe um, I guess, what are some of the things, I, I shouldn't just guess, I mean, what are some of the things you've seen when you've put this technology out there? That you yeah, I can, I can tell you. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, the, the first thing that, that comes up to, to anyone's head is, is that uh, we skip uh, unfull bins, but actually this is not what we do, because if the truck is on the street, so the, the most common thing to do is to, to make sure that the street is empty. Uh, but the question is, which truck will enter which streets and when? Uh, just a simple uh, example, uh, you know, from each street, uh, uh, street or district, we have a different amount of waste. And it makes a lot of sense to go and collect uh, the places that are lighter, that you have less waste that's coming out from them, and then to collect the heavier. Interesting. So it's a that? small, yeah, it's small change but you have less uh, fuel consumption, so you have less emissions. Oh, nice. By, by this, this simple change, yeah? Uh, but but for, the, this is a, you know, for the small picture, the, the large picture is, again, to plan better, to understand better what is happening on the streets. When, when you know where uh, uh, issues, okay? <laughs> so you can have a much better uh, service. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I'm such a, I guess, tactical guy that when I hear about a small thing like, you know, we'll pick up the lighter trash first and then get the heavier trash. I nerd out over that because that's like, oh, cool. I would never have thought of that. <laughs> so, that's that's yeah, awesome. No, if you will observe, you know, some <laughs> hundreds of thousands of tons of uh, waste collection, like, I bet it will come, uh, it will cross your mind. Can you monitor the truck's <laughs> fuel economy or is that something you have to sort of extrapolate just based on the... Uh, other data points. Yeah, yeah, you can stop it a lot. Because again, you can measure everything, but one of the, the great questions right at the beginning what was what is valuable enough to measure and what you, you would like to, what we call to, to have an estimation. Yeah, makes sense. Know, <laughs> to guess and to estimate together. Uh, well, if it's good enough, you know, the 80-20 rule. 
Yeah. yeah you want to invest, yeah. 20% of the investment, get 80% of the uh, in the information, and to fill the gaps with with good uh, uh, with common sense. Yeah, makes sense. What is and I forgive me if you can't answer this, but what is like the most valuable piece of data you can have on a piece of garbage? Um, I, I can. It's, it's a great question, and you know it's. It's different answer for for any user. Oh, interesting. But, yeah, but but we see that the quality of service, where at the beginning we were not sure how important is that, because you know it's important as a, a property owner or a business owner. But in some of the cases, if you will ask a, a person on the street, they will tell you that maybe the the municipality is not very sensitive about it. But we learned that they are very sensitive about it. The most important thing for them is the quality of service to make sure that they have collected what they have should collect. And if something gets wrong, and you know, when you're collecting dozens of thousands of bins per day, you will always have fouls. And they they will to invest in order to to know it right on the spot and to have the the opportunity to fix it before the end user. Which is the householder yep. or the business owner will, will uh, pay attention for that. That's it. So it's not so even really about. Service. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm saying just quality of service. I think it's the the leading uh, factor for everyone. That makes a lot of sense. So I, I, I guess I went right to garbage because you know I, I was sort of getting warmed up, and internet of garbage eludes you know like pieces of garbage. But then when you're talking about it, I feel like it's not about any one piece of garbage so much as it is about, like you said, quality of service, you know, how the routes people are taking, um, you know, uh, probably, you know, are they getting every bin? Uh, just if there's an incident, you know, can you look back into it and see what happened and, and back it out, I'm assuming is, is probably part of it. So that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, not, not what I would have thought out of the gate. And just for people listening, we did talk before this, but it was a week ago. And so I'm still kind of remembering some of the details, which I think is a good thing, because if, if it comes off too scripted, I feel like it's boring content. So one thing I did ask, though, that I sort of want to ask again, just for the for the camera and the show is like, how'd you come up with the idea mm -hmm. for Green Q? Just because I, I don't know that would have occurred to me. Yeah, I, I think at first we live in Israel, all the founders. And uh, we were lucky to begin quite late as a country with all the issues of uh, uh, sorting in the origin. When we as residents should sort the waste to different uh, streams, to different bins. Uh, and, and it was very interesting for us, you know. We had the uh, companies before, we were all technical guys. And uh, one major hobbit is to to meet together to have a barbecue and to to raise ideas and then to <laughs> kill them okay and and nice. <laughs> uh, yeah and one of us uh, uh, paid attention to the amazing fact that the the government is investing huge amount of money in what they call education uh, to educate people to to separate to sort and and there's the question okay you invest a lot of money what is the outcome how do you measure it? So what do you do with the money? <laughs> what works, what's not, what isn't? So it, it was interesting for us to find technological uh, solution to provide information to the decision makers. And you know, the idea evolved and, and we learned that this is the small thing. <laughs> Actually, nobody really knows what is happening on the street. Even Google doesn't. So if, if I can't Google them to find out the beans were collected in a specific street, <laughs> which is a very, very uh, valuable information in terms of of money, in terms of, uh, again, quality of service. You should remember that the money in waste is converted directly to emissions in the city. Because if I invested money to have the truck uh, driving over an unnecessary ride, so actually I turned it into emissions where people live. So. So you'd think, um, yeah, and we figured out that there is a, a gap, so we we've looked for a way to fill it. That's awesome. How are you? And I guess just because I'm 
you know, head of a few startups myself and I'm interested in the process. How do you start sort of testing your hypotheses that there was there was gold here and, and sort of checking to see what the market really needed and learning more about waste? Yeah, so actually, we, we, we went in few few paths the same way. So one is to, to say, okay, let's say that we have the solution. How large is the issue? Not just that uh, we think that it's important, but how, how much the, you know, the universe is investing in that. So we learned that we're speaking about a more than trillion dollar market. A third of it is uh, invested in collection. And we have seen that before, you know, universities uh, and uh, commercial entities invested in research and find out that with good uh, information, you can cut uh, in 30% the, the operational cost. Wow. Did you... So it's third of trillion and third of that. So yeah, it's huge numbers. So, so that, that is... Is that domestically why. in Israel or is that globally? No, 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 no globally. Okay, cool. Why is that? It's small, it's <laughs> like, a, like a town. <laughs> <laughs> Very important town, but a town. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, and then then we look from different side, because if it's interesting, so we we must see that someone tried to to solve it before. So we done like a tech research, and we we see a lot of uh, interesting ways uh, that people tried to solve it before, including mature technologies that that were. Uh, you know, a, a lot of investment in them. But what was imp interesting, that most of the trucks in the world are, are driving without a specific uh, solution for that and, and don't bring that, this uh, set of information. Um, so we have seen that someone tried to hack it before, and we have seen that there is a, a huge price uh, at the end. Uh, so it's probably interesting. And then we went uh, to interview <laughs> waste collection managers. <laughs> Very clever persons with, with a lot of uh, experience. And a lot of them told us what they have tried to do in order to fetch this information from the streets. What were some of the things people uh, tried to do to get the information before, you know, having like a cohesive mm -hmm. system in place? Yeah, you know, you speak with, with 60 years old uh, person high level in, in the municipality and they are driving their car 5 a.m. To, to be before the truck. They want to be in the in the in the in you know time window where the, the <laughs> bins are already on the street but the truck didn't collect them and, and they're just looking inside. They oh, are nice. sending teams to the streets. They've tried to have some kind of a app that they build a, for the driver to uh, to report, so they really want the information. They are paying for uh, uh, outside the firms to calculate, to evaluate, to think, to to guess what is happening on the streets. But I would imagine you we can only them, do okay. so much with with bad or absent data. I mean, yeah, you know, when when they hear the idea that you can just bring them the information to the desktop. It's huge. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just imagining, you know, I guess being a waste management manager, waking up, you know, at some ungodly hour, like 3 a.m., just to be out there at, at 4.30 or 5. And, I mean, that's a lot of trouble to go to to try to collect data, which probably is a much smaller data set than what you were able to give them. I mean, you can only look in so many bins as one person with a narrow window of time, you know, trying to, to do that. And, you know, I'm assuming you check again after the trucks are through and try to, you know, interpolate sort of who covered what routes and, and things like that. Uh, what have been some of the reactions to people using the technology? I guess, how quickly can your customers get optics on the on the data? So, like, do they can they see right away, like the next day or does it take a few days to compile and, and get to them? Like, how soon do you get a reaction after you deploy a system? So, so basically, you know, at the, at the first day of the, after the system is installed, you already get information. Cool. If you want to have uh, information, because one of the, the advantages and the challenges is to, to be in the middle, okay? Because you have a lot of information coming from the streets and you want to make 
insights to digest it a little bit so you can tell them, okay, now you have something interesting. Now we, now we have missed a bin, okay? Uh, because to tell them that you, you were collecting here, 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 and there, so, you, you know, okay, it's too much information. Yeah, we already knew that. <laughs> yeah, or even if we didn't, so it's, it's too yeah, much. Okay? That makes sense. But to tell them, okay, the system was learning the path, the path of the collection, and now we can tell you that here there is something interesting, here there is, just keep the bin here, here there is something odd, please tell us what is happening over there. So this is exactly what, what they want, and that takes uh, at least a few days. Makes sense. Uh, and, and days of collection, because if you collect in a certain street just once a week, so you, you have to have a few runs. So it depends, <laughs> like everything. So you have to run the route, you know, like at least three times, it sounds like, before you have any kind of baseline to figure out. Exactly. From. Yeah. Yeah, but this is for the best line, for the, you know, a proof of job being done, for the ability to just to sit in the office and to go manually and to see what was happening, I do it from, from day one. That's pretty cool. What is the, um, I mean, th this might be getting a little too into the weeds, but I'm kind of a nerd so i'm curious like how do your users visualize the data like do you have an app is there like spreadsheets they can output to all of the above a website like i guess what would it look like to be to be using the platform and, and kind of peer and end is it like a map view is it more text-based some combination of both yes so we have the the, the main uh, screen is is a like a map oriented uh, screen you know with few gouges that you can see cool how many of you collected today compared to what you were supposed to collect to this uh, uh, point at a time. Um, and you have one very successful feature that, that we got from the users is that we text them. Nice. So they do whatever they do. They are managers. They have a lot of things to do. They get a text message. It's very cool for, for the small players. Uh, the larger, they have uh, API, so some of them are not watching our screens at all. They have API and we push all the uh, information to the ERP systems that they already have. Oh, cool. Uh, already got, and they have, you know, they have all the, the business intelligence that they want already implemented. So, yeah, it's very easy. That's awesome. So they, yeah, the idea is that they will not have to change the, the, the way that you know, the, the daily uh, behavior and the daily way of uh, consuming the information. Yeah, I feel like that's a really smart approach. You know, a lot of people go in, especially with engineering backgrounds, and will just try to add extra features. Like, Can't you see how great this is? Would, why wouldn't you want to learn a whole new platform? And I feel like what you're doing is a lot more... Uh, resilient to um, user resistance, right? Which, I mean, if you don't make people change their habits, then, you know, you're, you're not, it's not a chore for them to learn the platform. So that's pretty yeah, cool. It, it's much more challenging for us. I'm sure. Actually, this is the thing. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I remember that I was examining new, new systems for, it was a lot of, a lot of years ago uh, for the army. And I was sitting with engineer and I told him, but, the main feature of this system is this and that. Where is it? And he told me, what's the problem? You see, you have this menu, and then you press this, and then there is <laughs> sub-menu, you press that, and then... But I told him, you know, someone is firing on the, on the vehicle. You, you can't go on all of these <laughs> menus and sub-menus. <laughs> so, it's yeah, I, I think that it's very important to have the user in the, in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> what's the problem yeah, that makes a lot of sense <laughs> i um yeah i feel like I, I talked about this a little bit in the last episode so i want to be careful how much i say but yeah i do i do love that design thinking and, and just thinking about it from the perspective of being under fire and having to go through a series of menus is is hilarious i mean the, the fact that somebody thought that was a good idea it's like, I feel like you could you could get killed before you even <laughs> get to the third menu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's that's pretty over the top. But but it's very organized. <laughs> <laughs> the question is if you are organized, organized uh, sensitive or uh, you know easiness sensitive. 
I think that these in the swings. Yeah, I think so too. And the average user, I mean, I don't know. I, I've dealt with a bunch of different types of people. So I mean, there's there's like the classic design thinking, which I mean, it's not that it's come out recently, but the idea that you know you should sit down with the user first and survey and see how people function and then build that into your requirements and you know all of it's derived from you know what does the user actually want to engage with and then the other one is well if you just list things alphabetically <laughs> just an intelligent person can find it because they can do the whole alphabet in their head and, and people don't really want to do that I, I don't think so I, I tend to favor to you know like if some text looks better in a place I like that more than if it as alphabetically arranged you know or if it's just more apparent or you know if the you know your your tendency is to want to you know engage with a certain element you know I mean I've seen it go too far though I mean I, I feel like there's been some interesting like over the top design trends where you have ambiguous icons so you'll have a, an image but nobody ever defines what that means and so now the user has to learn through trial and error what the app does because you know they <laughs> they tried to be too anti functionality so I don't know that's that's an interesting one what is your what does your design team look like? Like, how do you how do you figure out you know how to implement these features and and get them get them built? Yeah, so, so first is to begin with is good uh, you know design and definition is very important, and then get, you know the process you build what you think will be useful. You you let the real users to use it, and you see what they're using and what they're not because. This is the, the real way to learn. Yeah, makes sense. And things that you, you know, you think that it will be very important. This is the feature killer. Everybody will use it, and and you know, nobody is using it. Nobody, <laughs> not just a little amount of nobody. <laughs> or maybe it's not as that as important as that. You no. Know? It makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you do you look over the user's shoulder? Do you do you have analytics coming back from your platform? A little bit of both. Like, how do you how do you observe those deployments and figure out what's so, used? So, a lot of that is, you know, with human uh, uh, communications, and uh, the other, it's very easy to see from the server side. You know, we we don't look over the shoulder, but we see what are the inquiries, what are the reports that are really being generated. That makes sense. Uh, so, it's it's quite uh, quite easy to see. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That seems like a good way to do it. And and sometimes by the sales, you know, we have invested a lot in designing the the right uh, panel for the drivers. I don't know, nobody, nobody is buying that. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe maybe it's really for managers. Yeah, it makes. It seems like the manager is the main customer from, from everything you've been saying. Mm -hmm. I, I had a a friend who did a company where they made yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's good to know. Uh, I, I had some friends who had a startup where they they made a company that made water filters for like third world countries, and they designed this awesome water filter that was great to engage with. It clogged as you used it, so you could never drink out of it when it was um, consumed and no longer effective as a water filter. Um, they kind of went through great pains to make it ergonomic. So I, I think one of the design elements was. You could take a backpack down to a river and fill it with uh, with dirty water, and then because people have these sitting around their hut all day and they're not necessarily drinking all the water right at once, rather than filtering the water mm -hmm. as it went into the backpack, it would filter on the output side. So you would you the would pour out. it through a filter. Yeah, exactly. So very cool. very clever. Um, but the company eventually ran out of money and and they uh, they had to close it down because their customer wasn't the user of the water filter. It was non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross. And when people donate to a relief effort, they want to see you bought, you know, X number of water filters. We don't care how good they are to use. We want to see that, you know, my, mm -hmm. you know, hundred dollars got the most amount of water filters they could get. And they weren't cost competitive to the lowest price water filters. So they lost. I feel like the fact that, you know, you know, who your customers are, what their habits are, how they're organized, how they think, you know, what they need. And then you're open to being wrong about all that and collecting new information. Um, I, I, I think that's really smart. And I mean, you know, not to not to kiss your ass too much, but I mean, I, I think you're going about it the right way. So it's, it's cool to hear that. Yeah, you know, the, the, this is the road. 
Yeah. Yeah. You go on a trip, you find interesting things. And it's a, it's a long trip. <laughs> Amen to that. So we started talking on the phone before this about, uh, about off-roading a little bit. And I looked on your LinkedIn and saw you also had an off-road recovery business. How do you get into that? Uh, I went on a trip and got stuck. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and, and I figured that it's a, a huge fun to uh, all the, the off-road uh, recovery thing. Um, but then after I dealt with it a lot and also from the professional side, uh, the, the issue that there was... There's no like a standard service for that. No, if you get stuck, you don't know what will happen now. <laughs> when someone will come, how much would you pay? What are the terms of service? And uh, with, with good partners, we thought that it can be very cool to, to solve it, to make sure that exactly like you have AAA on road, yep. you have yeah, risk for you off road. So that's, that's awesome. That's what we've done. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it works for now almost 16 years. Wow, years that's, that's incredible. Yeah. That, that, that was my first company. That's, that's awesome. More about service than about technology, but yeah, interesting. I feel like at the end of the day, it's all about service though. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes you enable that with a new tech, sometimes you don't, but I mean, yeah, if nobody wants to buy yeah. it or engage with it, you know, what the hell are you doing? And I, I guess the reason I brought it up when I did is, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, it seemed like you had, you had a well-informed approach uh, to Green Q with looking at the user first and, you know, what does the market actually want and how do people want to engage with this? And from the people I've talked to and interviewed and known over the years, I, I feel like the ones that have businesses in different domains are sort of the most, the least likely to fall in love with an idea and like the most likely to sort of look at, you know, is this going to make money or not? And then make decisions off of that. And so it's, I, I, I mean, I'm just getting to know you now, but I'm, I'm starting to see kind of some, some patterns there. I it's like. a good way, uh, you know, because <laughs> mon money is not as important as that, but it's a good way to measure if it's valuable. Yeah. Because if it's sense. valuable, people are, you know, wasting money for that. So investing money for that. Yeah. Spending money for that, you know. Yeah, for sure. And if it's not important for anyone, so maybe it's it's not important. It can be a good habit, hobby maybe, but yeah, no more than that. I, I've had tons of ideas like that over the years. <laughs> it's fun, but yeah, yeah, it's not maybe not something the market needs or wants. Yeah, no, but for our generation, it's great because the the time to make I, and and something that works out of an idea it's quite short today so we can have a lot of ideas and we will be retiring we'll have the time to do them yeah absolutely <laughs> the ones that didn't make sense commercially maybe those you're right they get saved for retirement yeah. and those are how they're fun to do yeah yeah why not <laughs> i used to when i was when i was a kid growing up in the 90s i used to i saw that movie wild wild west with will smith which Admittedly, a horrible movie, but not, not a great movie, but it was the first DVD I ever had. And I remember, and now DVDs are long since extinct, but I remember ever since I saw that, I wanted like a giant walking spider robot that I could drive around. <laughs> but there's no market for that. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> nobody, nobody needs not sure. or wants that. I've seen a prototype for that. <laughs> you uh, have? I think in the last year. Yeah, because you can go where, where no, one, no one drove before. When you have uh, eight, uh, eight legs on the ground. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I, I saw a video, I think it was from the 1980s, from John Deere, where they were doing something like that, but it was a quadruped, so they had four legs. And um, I, it, you might find it interesting if you saw a prototype recently, because I feel like the road's been paved, and I don't know if it's, if it's commercially viable or not. I feel like there's got to be a reason why people aren't building those types of vehicles more because uh, I, I know they've existed over the years and you've seen like I think there was a guy at MIT that made a few of them that you know but that's academia so that's like a different set of rules than commercialism uh, I don't know I, uh, I don't no, know you can look to the stars no roads yeah I'd be curious to know <laughs> whose prototype it was uh, if you can't say on the air that's fine but that'd be, that'd be a I fun one find to find out and, uh, and link you yeah awesome thank you Appreciate it. 
So what are some of the crazier things you've seen when you've been doing off-road recovery in terms of just how am I going to solve this problem? <laughs> you, know? you know, so from that you have a lot off-road because off-roading is all about no standards, no paved road. But I think that <laughs> most common thing that always make you, you know, amazed is the huge distance between what people can tell you over the phone and what you see <laughs> with your own eyes. <laughs> you know? Nice. No, it's, it's just a very small thing and it's just a little assistance and you, know, you find the, the, the vehicle on the side uh, in the creek. Uh, <laughs> or baseball, you know. Wow. It, it, it's very dramatic. You have to come quickly. We need assistance. We don't know what to do. And you know, just getting into the car and, and driving it out. So... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, in, into the customer's car? Yeah, if needed. Wow, <laughs> that's all it takes. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, the human behavior is always the most interesting factor. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> um, I remember, uh, it's probably embarrassing to admit on, on the air, but I will anyway. I, I was traveling around Europe uh, not too long ago, and I... It was my first time driving a stick shift car and maybe I had at this point in the story um, like 12 to 16 hours of stick shift driving experience under my belt and I uh, my French is not so good I, I speak a little bit but I, I'm not the best at uh, you know it's not that advanced you know and so I missed a road sign <laughs> that said hey don't go here <laughs> basically <laughs> Luckily, this was during the summer and not the winter. This was in the French Alps. And I got this uh, little Fiat 500 <laughs> stuck uh, off-road. And I was able to get it out on my own, but there was a moment where I was panicking. I was, you know, I was really worried, you know, like, what the hell did I do? Did I break the transmission? I've never worked on a manual transmission, be never operated a manual transmission before. That smells like smoke. Did I just smoke the clutch? What the hell am I doing? <laughs> You know, I should probably kill myself. <laughs> you take a break. Yeah, you see, but, but, but you're here to tell us. So yeah, exactly. Probably went well. <laughs> and then you breathe a little bit, right? And you, you sort of go through the panic and, and you know, you, okay, well, I'm still here. You know, that's the worst thing that can happen, you know, probably hasn't happened yet. But let me, let me see what I can do, you know, maybe turn off the car, breathe a little bit, get back in. And I remember I was able to actually drive out of there in one of my proudest moments. <laughs> I hadn't flipped it, you know, I, I, at that point, I think I'd made a few phone calls and figured out I could get a mechanic if I needed one or a recovery crew. But, you know, it's just, I think once the anxiety wears off, you become a problem solver, you know, and, and then, you know, you're a lot more effective. <laughs> so, or if you don't let it come in the first place. Do. Yeah, to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Sit down, relax, have a cup of coffee. Yeah, well, and I was, uh, you know, instructing new uh, recovery guys from the side of the company. So the first thing to do is to do nothing. You get there, you speak with the people, you drink coffee, you think. And then you begin. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel like that would be fun work. I mean, it just sounds like, like a lot of puzzles in a row, basically. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot also of, you know, adrenaline in there. You have a, a physical walk. Nice. Not always uh, very convenient. You know, in Israel, we have both snow and both, uh, you know, <laughs> very hot days uh, in the desert. And sometimes you get into a job that you think it will just take you a few hours and it'll be at evening time back and you find yourself having two days off roading <laughs> so yeah <laughs> that's awesome it makes very flexible say again it, it makes you very flexible that makes sense <laughs> yeah i think it was a connection issue but that's that's awesome yeah no i would imagine it's like really good for mental fortitude and and just getting better at being in stressful situations in general i mean you know just to to kind of fix that over and over and over again. Yeah, I think that the, the Navy, off-roading, <laughs> living in Israel are things that make, uh, make us very <laughs> resistant.
Touche. <laughs> <laughs> What would you? How that, would you? That's an having kids. Oh wow! <laughs> you yeah, know, maybe so... having kids in, in the first place. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> so I'll be honest. I don't have kids. I don't live in Israel. I've never been in the Navy, mm. and I've never properly gone off roading. <laughs> so I feel like my subset of experience has been very different. <laughs> but I feel like I want to go off roading. Um, like really, really. Like the more I talk to you about it, I have I have some friends that are into it that have you know, spent a lot of money and time on, on overlanding vehicles. Um, what would you recommend to somebody that wants to go down that road? You know, like how would, how would you get started? Uh, is there any like low cost way to sort of get a toe in the water before you buy, you know, a, a truck and, and start fixing it up and sink in, you know, $30,000 or whatever? I think it's very common in the, in the community of off-roading to have uh, guests that can just, uh, you know, join a club and in a lot of uh, cases they will be happy to have visitors on board and see if you like it. Cool. You can, you can join uh, when we have a uh, company time and drink you. What we do is to, to go and uh, have some uh, offer time. All, all the founders like it. So um, actually I, I met two of the founders off-roading. So. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So uh, you, you can join us. Yeah, I think I, I think I probably will <laughs> given the opportunity. Do you do you find that the sport attracts like a certain type of person, um, or I mean, is it just kind of like anywhere else? Like you just have a pretty big cross section of folks, and yeah, I think that uh, actually in the wild it doesn't have to be connected to vehicles. Everything goes. You meet everyone, and and it you know it's fun because. Just getting across someone in the city, you will, you will not speak with them. You, you know, you, you have it every minute, a lot of times. But then you meet uh, someone in nature, so it's we are here uh, together alone. So you have a different, uh, uh, you know, way to bond. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and that sounds like a blast. Anyone over there, anyone. That's that's really cool. There's, there's an engineer I work with who, um, I guess he was doing some off-roading, um, I think it was in uh, Moab, Utah, in the United States, and oh. he, he had the, a... The holy land of uh, off-roading. Yeah, it's I, I, <laughs> the fact that people think of it that way in Israel was awesome. <laughs> so, it's... Um, I, I don't remember what he... I think he cracked his transmission housing... Uh, on this, he had, a, I think it was like a, like a 50 cc dirt bike and he was out there by himself and apparently he was able to hitch a ride on a much larger vehicle. And I guess he said he didn't realize how dehydrated he was or, you know, the fact that he was just out there until these people picked him up and he just started talking like, you know, he was almost hallucinating, you know, he was like, oh my God, there's this box on wheels. This is amazing. <laughs> Like, you know, and, you know, I, I guess he, he sort of realized, you know, like he, he asked me not to tell his parents and they're not going to be able to ID him through this. So I won't, but he's like, I don't want to not be able to do it anymore. And they would freak out. <laughs> they knew how close to death I came. <laughs> and so I, yeah. I guess I, in my head, I had the idea that like, maybe you, you get like a certain type of like more adventurous or more resilient or, you know, just more, um, you know, endurance sort of interested person but i mean it sounds like that's the case with a lot of people but you know it's just just people <laughs> hanging out and you know yeah. everything happens yeah which is cool <laughs> <laughs> so what else what else have you seen uh, i guess in that in that world that you know you weren't expecting to until you saw it wow well, that, that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> because because it, it's quite you know, it's vice versa. You, you expect to see the, the unexpected. You, this is the reason that we we like to to do uncommon things. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, like like uh, on the hobby side and both on the no, professional side to build new things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I guess I'm probably similarly wired because I, I try to, you know, 
ask questions that get into these war stories with people, you know, and <laughs> talking about, you know, kind of, I don't know, just hearing those anecdotes, I, I guess I get to live it a little bit vicariously, and so that's one of the reasons it's interesting to me. Um, I guess maybe to go a different direction with it, is there anything, uh, you'd mentioned being in the Navy, um, is there anything from those days that you feel like you still use in your work today, or, you know, is kind of correlated? Actually, I think that a lot, because you know, you, you you gather very young, so a lot of the the habits and the you know, if you have something jo job to have done, you you will not go to sleep till you you did it. So things that <laughs> you, you can get it from a lot of things. It's it's very uh, a common way to to act. But I got it from the navy. Makes sense. And. Um, but but this is from the the first days uh, over there when I was uh, sailing. Uh, but after that, when I get to the headquarters, so a lot of the the ways of how do you analyze uh, an issue, how do you uh, define a technological solution, how do you examine if w what you have planned is a good idea, and when. You know, when when it hits reality, so you can never do everything that you have planned. Yeah, makes uh, sense. Always new uh, challenges, and then you have to take decisions. What is most important? What is less important? What, what I'm going to invest and to be slower now, because I have to have it, and what I will do later on or never. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. <laughs> and and this is so. So all the methods. How to develop and how to uh, uh, to test. Um, but we got it from there, and so my, my co-founder was on the technological arm. So we have like the same methods, and we use them in the company, L like a lot of other Israeli companies. Yeah, it's not something that we invented. <laughs> it works, so we we use it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I do, I can identify a lot with that idea of, you know, like not being able to go to sleep until it's finished. And so, I mean, I feel like in, in the engineering world, there's quite a few projects where that's been the case. And, you know, if something goes wrong, it just means you're sleeping less until it gets fixed. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think it's, a, you, it's a way, a state of mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it really kind of comes down to just not being able to accept failure. <laughs> and, <laughs> Or, you know, at least not in certain things. I mean, obviously, you got to prune off some options to be able to pursue others. But, you know, if you, if you take on a mission, I think, or at least if I take on a mission, I, I try not to... At first, I try not to take on a mission that I don't think is achievable. So, like, if somebody comes to me with a problem and says, hey, can you, you know, build this thing? You know, if it doesn't seem like it can be done in the amount of time and money they've got to do it, I'll... I'll I'll be honest and say, hey, you know, I think that's mighty ambitious. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that's achievable uh, with that timeline and budget. What about this? <laughs> you know, or like, <laughs> would you consider that? You know, and so sometimes I, I feel like that that kind of helps if you sort of set yourself up for success in the beginning. But then, I guess you still can't succeed 100 percent of the time. I mean, I'm sure you've been in situations where you've pushed people to their limits and yourself included and then you still haven't hit a goal i mean that that's happened to me at least so yeah i think that 100 percent is a, it's a bad word <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> it's a good thing to aim to but you never get the 100 percent and if you you will try you know it's you get the 80 percent it's like that then 90 percent and then the last uh, few percent it's like uh, you can't climb that cliff yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly too much time, too much effort, too much everything. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. also, if someone tells you that something works for, for one hundred percent, so what, what are they doing? Nothing. <laughs> 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 Nothing works for one hundred percent. Not even a brick. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> figure out a way to crack that. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that all the soil that we have—it it was a rock. <laughs> the past. <laughs> so, this brick is defective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I so, don't believe in 100%. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't either, if I'm being <laughs> honest. But, I mean, it's easy to get caught up in it because I feel like sometimes you still have to talk that way. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, th I think that's a healthier approach, the one you're taking. How do, you, how do you decide what aspects to prioritize of an effort and, like, what to deprioritize? Do you have... So one tool I try... I, I'm still struggling to find, like, a good one that I always use myself, but... Like this year, I messed around with something called an Eisenhower matrix, which apparently Dwight D. Eisenhower would use to prioritize his action items. And I'm trying to remember. Um, I think it was the axes were urgent and important. And then yeah, you had yeah. the four different categories. And then if it's not urgent, not important, you just don't do it. Um, if it's urgent but not important, I think that's when you delegate. And then if it's urgent and important, you should do it yourself. And then if it's important but not urgent, you postpone. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this is for the personal tasks uh, prioritization. But for, if you look from the, you know, product wise or something like that, so I think that uh, maybe it's always you should consider comparing to the needs. It's, it's very, I think, practical way to think if it's something that you want to do now or not. So can you can you walk me through maybe like an example of a time when you've done yeah, that? Yeah, because you have a lot of features that, you know, you are wrote down that you should do them and now got the time to do them, but you have few of them, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you if you ask yourself, okay, what is the, the client's needs, okay? And then you will choose the oh, one that is okay, yeah, cool. it's most, you know, bullseye to the needs. So do that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's a... It's a no, good way of uh, like a thinking exercise. Yeah, how do you how do you ascertain what the clients need the most? Just qual qualitatively, just through discussions, or do you have yeah, rankings? You know, to define the needs correctly, I think it's it's an art. It's the most I important agree. things for for uh, especially for small companies because you know, large companies can do more things at the time. <laughs> yeah. Small companies done. So, <laughs> um, I, I think that first of all is, is to to get used to things like that and to to get used to speak like that to customers. Yeah. Because you can ask them, "What do you want?" Which is the easy way to do anything. Of course. <laughs> say, okay, the customer. Delegate. The, the, yeah, they're always right. So let's say, okay, we have these few things. What do you want? Okay. And you can have a deeper discussion about the needs. What, what do you try to do? What do you try to solve? What, what, what are your KPIs? And then it's a, it's a needs-driven uh, discussion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then I think that it's something that uh, you should convert into what to do. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Makes a lot because you can only. I mean, that's discovery, and you know, that's the whole purpose is to collect data, and then you're supposed to go home or to the office or wherever you're meeting with your colleagues and talk about it and figure out a next path based on what you saw. So, yeah, but yeah. it's much more challenging, and also when you work with large uh, entities, so they are not always used to speak like that. They, they will have tenders, so in the tender they will write what is the quantity, what is the spec. In a lot of cases, say, but, but what what are you trying to achieve with that? <laughs> <laughs> I can sell you that, but no added value. Um, what are so you mentioned maybe like the weight feature as being one where it's maybe people think it's going to be more valuable than it is. Yeah, the the weight is a very good example because it's very cool to know exactly what to weigh any bean. But in the real world, if you're trying to no, speaking in a general way, to manage a, a city or manage a waste collection company, in a lot of cases, the specific uh, uh, way of each bin is much more less valuable than you could think. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, to, to understand where are the issues, it's much more valuable than you think, because when you don't really see the picture, so you know who is calling you, you know. You don't really know uh, where, where are the faults. Um, so it's a very good example. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
So how do you actually collect data on the trash? Like what, what types of sensors are you using? Um, yeah, is it user reporting? Yeah. Is it all based on sensor data? Is it somewhere in between? So that takes us to the, to the first uh, questions that we asked ourselves. But what will make the system usable? Why people will implement our system if they didn't implement other systems? Of, or if they implemented but abandoned them. So, yeah. well, and, and we learned that uh, uh, one of the important things that you have to have systems that can work without installing anything on the bins. Just to have some figures, so the, the ratio between bins and trucks is uh, one truck, a few thousand bins, 10,000 bins, <laughs> depends on the way that you are uh, uh, collecting the waste. Uh, so you can invest a lot on the truck, but if you even if you have to do just one small thing for each bin every year, it's, it's too complicated to operate. That makes sense. Um, and there are also a lot of issues with who is the owner of the bin, can you install on it, can't you? So in any case, we, we decided right at the beginning that all the information will be gathered from the truck side and automatically. Nice. Because the easiest way is to have some uh, mobile uh, device on board, and the driver will tell us what is happening. The the guy that is tossing the the beans will tell us, but they are doing other things. Yep. It's safety, okay. And also, th this is a thing that was tried endless times before us, a lot of times so many times that we couldn't count how many times. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they just have different things on their heads. They, they have uh, cars waiting behind the truck. They will not press buttons. Yeah, or if they have to, they, you will get one, 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 A, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever gets them press past button, that press screen. Button, press button, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, it, so the way is automatically. And, and the technological solution was changing on the way. But uh, today we have a system that is uh, based on visual aids. Actually, you, have, you know, like we're mimicking the way that uh, we as human beings understand what is happening. So you can imagine like you have a, a person that is sitting on the truck and telling the server what is happening, but there is no person, okay? <laughs> instead of the eyes, you have a camera. Instead of the brain, you have a, a local uh, computing unit. Yeah. Uh, we, we need a lot of uh, computing power on board. And actually, exactly like we see in the brain, not in the eyes. So the system see in the computer, not in the camera, and uh, telling us what is happening. Uh, if it's a new type of truck or something which is complicated, so we, we will use other sensors as well. Nice. Uh, and yeah, this is basically it. Uh, the basic system is uh, visual based. That's cool. So it, it sounds like it's a computer, it's a cellular modem of some kind, and yeah, then communication, you've got camera, uh, and then GPS, GPS. Nice, yeah, cool. And you can correlate where the truck was at when it saw a thing. What what other sensors would you put on like a more complicated truck? Yeah, so if we want to know uh, what is the uh, to weigh the beans, yeah. So we have also uh, sensors that feels the actually we feel how how much the metal is bending. Oh, so cool. We can interpolate it to the force that was used uh, to, to pick the bin. We know also what was the acceleration rate, so we can calculate out of it what was the, the way of the waste. Yeah, makes uh, sense. Roughly, yeah, roughly, but it's not for, uh, for billing, it's for managing. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if you need a very, very specific uh, readings, for example, if you want to, to have a pay the throw method, so we have a special equipment for that that is attached to our system. And then you have a very um, certified to, to, to scale and to build uh, module. Uh, but it's very complicated and expensive. So it's, it's not for management. It's for, uh, for building. Makes and sense. this is basically it. And we have a, it's a, you need to have a very good server side because then you can, you know, it's, it's like you have a, a puzzle, but you don't know uh, what is the shape of the <laughs> of the parts? Okay, <laughs> so if you have a good server side, so you can understand 
take a decision what is happening now. Yeah. Okay, because the system is is added to trucks that are already built. Yeah, makes sense. So we need to, to take the decision that now we have a collection and then to understand how many bins were collected, what is the type and so and so. And after after you have done that, so it's easier to uh, to analyze each bin uh, independently. Yeah, and I'm assuming then you could go back and, I mean, I'm picturing like a Tinder interface where you can swipe through the bins. <laughs> I think that's what that is. <laughs> but, yeah, but but it's not us that we're doing that. It's, yeah. it's the server that is needed. Yeah, well, I, I would assume no manager wants to see all those pictures of, of bins. I mean, either. Oh, no, this is all the beauty that at the end of the day, you got a digital line. Yeah. Okay, that was the collection. That was the capacity estimation. That was the time. Now we have a report of all the the issues. And now you can play with the, the data. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, it sounds like a sweet product. Uh, it sounds like you're gaining traction. Um, yeah. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about or uh, plug while you're on here? I, I feel like this is like a good ending point. Cause it's... Um, yeah, we're always happy to have a, you know, we're, we're a small team. Uh, so I, I always ask to a little bit of the brain of, of the, the listeners, <laughs> if they have challenges, if they have ideas. Uh, uh, good partners in the US would be very, very happy. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, no, don't be shy. Connect uh, over the LinkedIn. Perfect. <laughs> Shlomi Ashkenazi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you're listening, thanks for coming in this far. Uh, subscribe, please. Check out Green Q. Uh, LinkedIn, Shlomi Ashkenazi, if you've got ideas or inroads to the US. Shlomi, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you.